Now in my third blessing of a child came by the way of our daughter, Amanda. I can still remember while they were in the hospital taking the boys to visit. I don't, know, I don't remember if we were able to see you or not. In those days, we may not have been able to. Maybe we did. But then the long promised a way to be able to see their brand new baby sister. John was eight, Eric was five. And they kind of did this, got this big window, you know, and they kind of did one of these things, looked in there, and they see all of these rows of babies, right? All lined up. Their eyes got as big as silver dollars. And then I remember John saying, okay, let's go. <laughs> They'd seen it, right? They'd seen it. But you see, I had given them a bribe. I told them that if they went and saw their new baby sister, I would take them out to eat. And this is over 40 years ago, so I'll tell you, going out to eat was a big deal, right? Especially after mom's in the hospital and they're eating dad's food. And I wasn't barbecuing them, so they were on their own there. But that was a big treat. The bribe was because we lived in a 1,200 square foot home in Florida. And we had to move the boys out of the extra bedroom, right? Ladies, I know you can appreciate that, right? Yep. So the guys had to all move into the same bedroom. And her bedroom then became, it's kind of in a separate area of the house. We had one bedroom, the kitchen, and then we had the other two bedrooms over here. What we soon realized was the fact that Amanda slept with her eyes partially open. That's weird. That is really weird. This became a problem because she couldn't go to sleep without having company in a room. That continued for a while, and I will tell you, well, not a little test of this, it continued for a long while. We would actually get down on our hands and knees, you know, after seeing her in her crib and try to crawl out of the room. But eyes are open, right? They got that little slit, they still open. She'd sit up in bed. Oh, man, really? So we read or heard that maybe noise would help. So we put a radio in her room. All night long it would be there. I remember we kind of did a little bit of shift work here. I actually had to be to work at 4 o'clock in the morning all the time. So when I took the bigger one of that, but we always had the radio on. And it was tuned to Paul Harvey. Anybody ever heard of Paul Harvey? Yep. Paul Harvey putting a spin on famous people, famous events. And he would say, in a moment, the rest of the story. Speaking of infamous people and events, we read, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. But God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. You all know that story. We've heard it from childhood. Adam and Eve had been created perfect, without sin, and were enjoying paradise in the Garden of Eden, until Satan slithers his little way into their lives. This liar begins a conversation with Eve and encourages her to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they do this, right? And what happens? Their eyes are both open. He lies to her. And because of this one act of disobedience, all people, along with all things, will surely die. Just as God said. I hesitate using this illustration. Are any car dealers here? Good, I can use this, right? Similar lie would be a car dealer telling you, go ahead, you qualify for more money than that on your monthly payment. It won't break the bank. And besides, 
praise. You deserve it. Friends, it's when you hear that. You should actually run. But we don't, do we? No, we don't run away from that. We go ahead, take a bite, and a few months later, our eyes are open to what the real cost of 72 months looks like. Adam and Eve, like children, they do the very thing God told them not to do. But the cost of their sin is immediately evident to them as their eyes are open. Their eyes are open to the difference between good and evil. I'm naked. That's the first thing we it's written in scripture. That's the first thing they see. And wouldn't you know it, just like any parent, at that time, here comes God walking through the garden. Right? It's not scriptural, but I think they probably say something like, quick, let's cover up. Knowing what they had done, God comes to them in love. God is walking in the garden. God knows what they have done. And God comes to them out of love. What else would you expect from God who created them for a purpose? And most of all, he loves them. When they come out from behind the bushes, God gives them the opportunity to confess and repent. But sin takes over. Rather than choosing good, they choose evil. Adam blames God. It's the woman you gave me. Eve blames the serpent. The devil made me do it. And the serpent, the devil, he probably laughs. In God's eyes, they were all guilty. And he lays permanent curses upon Adam and Eve. But he lays an eternal curse upon Satan, who had caused them to sin. Crawl on your belly and eat dirt. My words. That's what God says. Something that I think we should consider when we are confronted by Satan with temptation to do evil rather than doing something good. Crawl on your belly and eat dirt. That just kind of makes me feel good if I can respond to temptation in that way. And I think that that kind of wipes the smile off of Satan's face. Again and again and again. Fact. Every human being is created by God and is a descendant of Adam and Eve. Every human being knows the difference between good and evil. And likewise, every human being inherits sin's deadly effects, thanks to our giving into temptations. <coughs> giving into temptations has an eternal curse with it. And yet, there is someone can break that curse. Someone who knows you by name. Someone who has actually already broken that curse about your choosing evil over good. And now, the rest of the story. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus prays this for all human beings after having been nailed to a cross, placed between two criminals, two criminals that were guilty of sin. Three crosses, but two sinners. They all look alike hanging there on the cross. 
apostles, but only Jesus is wearing a crown. Made of thorns. Interesting when you think about it. A crown made of thorns. That was the curse that God put on Adam. Remember? Thorns and thistles will be for you the rest of your life. Pronounced to Adam, and now worn by the Son of God. And now, a little bit of a twist to the rest of the story. One of the criminals curses Jesus. The other criminal criticizes him for that. Imagine hanging on a cross, crucified, talking back and forth like that. But that's what they do. Because you see, the man who is critical of the other, when he looks at the face of Jesus, he sees the face of God. He sees the face of God wearing a crown of thorns. The face of God, the Lord of the universe. The only one who can welcome sinners to eternal salvation. He asked Jesus to remember him in his kingdom. And he receives what I would call almost a chilling response. You know what it is. Today you will be with me in paradise. Back. And the irony, the curse of the cross, Jesus wipes out Adam's wrong and pays for humanity's sin. Paradise is open to all sinful believers, without exception. But Jesus still isn't done. Jesus rises from the grave three days later, leaving his grave and the curse of the potential of your and my grave behind on a hillside outside of Jerusalem. This is where you and I join in as part of the rest of the story. For through faith, in our baptism, you and I have been joined together with Christ in his death, in his crucifixion, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Jesus takes the curse of your and my sin upon himself, replaces it with righteousness and forgiveness as a gift. Some scholars will call that happy or the great exchange, as Luther would say. Well, I'm no scholar, but I call it awesome. Awesome because God, the Holy Spirit, has opened our eyes to good. So we never need to hide from God like Adam and Abel. Like them, you too always remain in the presence of God. God did not desert them in the garden. They remained in his presence, accepted by God. Just as you are. God comes for you, just as he did for them. And he walks in this very garden in which we live, with you until you are fully restored on the last day. And because of Jesus and the power of God, you can say to Satan, crawl on your belly and eat dirt when you're recovered. And with that, Paul Harvey would say, Now you know the rest of the soul. Good day. And all God's people can say, Amen. Amen.